Hello, I'm Otis Corbett, and today I want to share a word about interdependence as I comment on Joshua 1, verses 10 through 18. This passage reads, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. And to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest, and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them, unto the Lord hath given your brethren rest, as he hath given you. And they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession, and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side Jordan toward the sun rising. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us we will go. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so we will hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. One of my favorite memories from raising our children was that season of life when uh, they were learning to dress themselves. Often as they were struggling to tie their shoes or to button their shirts, we would reach out to help them. And invariably, they would pull back away from us. They would protest vigorously. I can do it myself. And whenever I think of that, it makes me smile, but it also causes me to pause. You see, one of the deeply ingrained values in America is the idea of rugged individualism. This is the same idea expressed by the Frank Sinatra song, which proudly proclaimed that I did it my way. And it's also echoed in the final words of the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley, which famously or infamously declared, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Even our doctrine of salvation has often been used in some way to promote the idea of the autonomy of the individual, like the folk song that said, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. Me and Jesus, we got it all worked out. Me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. We don't need anybody to tell us what it's all about. We often pursue this value of rugged individualism to the point of it becoming a hindrance rather than a help. And if we would consider the biblical record, it will give us maybe a different perspective. So we begin with the request. When the children of Israel were delivered from slavery in Egypt, God had Moses lead them to the east bank of the Jordan River. Now, this took far longer than it should have. It took 40 years, and it shouldn't have taken that long. But that was the result of the sin of people of the people and of Moses. But the day came when they were assembled at the Jordan River, and Moses and Joshua were preparing them to enter and possess the land of Canaan, the promised land that God had given them. The specter of individualism arose, however, at, amongst tribes, but it was still tribes wanting their own way, their own thing. So the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they looked around themselves and they thought, hey, this place is great. We're already here. We like it. It's fertile. Uh, we want to stay. We're tired of all this wandering around. We want to stay right where we are. And so... They petitioned Moses to grant them their inheritance in that fertile piece of land east of the Jordan River. 
Now, our God, being a loving and benevolent God, allowed these two and a half tribes to settle in their chosen land. They were allowed to build houses, corrals for their, fa- uh, for their animals, and to make a life for themselves in that place. There was, however, a requirement. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over to the land which the Lord has given them? That's Numbers 32, 6 and 7. See, Moses quickly reminded these two and a half tribes that it was not right for them to sit in their homes, fat and sassy, while their brothers were having to fight for their inheritance, for their new homes. So Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh didn't even have to break a fingernail to gain their portion of the land, but the others were going to have to fight for it. So Moses and, of course, God would not stand idly by and allow them to rest at ease while the other part of the children of Israel were fighting. Not only was this morally and spiritually wrong, he would also wound the hearts and the morale of the rest of the tribes. Now, to their credit, the leaders of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh readily agreed to these terms. But there was a twist, and that twist might have been unexpected. You see, not only were these two and a half tribes expected to fight alongside the rest of Israel, but they were actually assigned to lead the charge. As we read in our scripture passage for today, the two and a half tribes had to cross the river first, leading the way into the promised land. They did so, and they marched and fought across the promised land until they were released by Joshua to return to their homes across the river. Now, what's the record of the rest of Scripture? Our passage for today is not the only place in Scripture that supports the value of interdependence amongst God's people. Actually, there are many examples. Here are some of them. In Nehemiah, we find that all of God's people in Jerusalem were expected to help rebuild the walls. Each family was given their portion of the wall to repair. And so everyone had to do their own work so that the whole city could be safe. Everybody had to work together to make that happen. In Acts 15, we see that the missionary enterprise had gotten ahead of their doctrine. See, Paul had caught some fish, Gentiles, that they had not anticipated. Did Paul, who was an apostle himself, decide what to do on his own? No, his church sent Paul and Barnabas to inquire from other churches about how to properly handle that situation. In in Romans 15, verses 25 through 27, we see evidence of churches working together in Asia Minor to send benevolence to the mother church in Jerusalem, which was under persecution and had had great needs. And we also can see how in 1 Corinthians 16, 19 through 20, that the churches of Asia were concerned about and expressed their care to the churches in Europe. Finally, in 2 Corinthians 11, 5 through 10, we can see evidence of churches cooperating to send out missionaries. If the biblical record is any indication, and of course it is, God expects His people to work together to build His kingdom. So what can we conclude? Let me close with this parable. A man once had a dream about the afterlife. He appeared in a room where sickly and emaciated people were sitting around a kettle full of delicious smelling food. Although the people were desperately hungry, they could not feed themselves because their arms and legs were in casts and their only utensils were four foot long spoons. Try as they might, they could not get any food into their mouths. As the man stared horrified, one of the pitiful creatures fell over, apparently dead. Next, the man was translated into another seemingly identical space with the same kettle, the same spoons, and the same casts on arms and legs. But he immediately saw a difference. However, because all the people gathered around that kettle were hale and hearty, with more than one of them approaching portliness. I resemble that remark. What made the difference in this scene was instead of trying to feed themselves with those long spoons, the people were using those spoons to feed the person across the kettle from themselves. Everyone was well fed 
and sitting tall and strong. So when the man awoke, he realized that the first room was a vision of hell and the second room was a vision of heaven. The moral of this dream is clear. When we forget that we need each other, we can make our existence a hell on earth. Conversely, when we are interdependent and work with one another, we can make our time on earth more like the heaven that we all look forward to enjoying. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next week with a, another word that we can share together. Every blessing. I'm Dr. Otis Corbett. Before I go, let me share my new book with you. Seminary taught me to be a pastor, but the Army taught me to be a leader. I would like to share how God melded those two skill sets in my new book, Decently and in Order. It's available now on Amazon in paperback and on Kindle. If you want to know more about effectively leading teams and events, check out Decently and in Order on Amazon.com. I believe you will find it eye-opening and helpful. That's Decently and in Order by Otis Corbett. Thanks for taking a look.